Hello, my friends. Hope you're doing well. And welcome to the Parkers Podcast, where we explore the latest parking trends and techniques to help you optimize your health and well-being. I'm your host, Teemu Arena, and today's guest requires no introduction. He's no other than Ben Greenfield. He's a walking Wikipedia of parking knowledge, and he has been several times speaker at the Parkers Summit. Ben is a multiple New York Times bestselling author, health consultant, host of the Ben Greenfield Live podcast, and professional speaker who has been on stage on various health and fitness conferences. He has written several excellent books, including Beyond Training, Boundless, Endure, and Fit Soul. In the following presentation from Parker Summit 2016 London, Ben will share with you his top daily biohacks, including breath work, jaw realignment, supplements, nutrition, intermittent fasting, exercise, sleep optimization, EMF protection, cognitive enhancement, just to name a few things. After his presentation, I will personally list some of my top daily routines that I do in the morning before I start my work day. So stay tuned for that one. Let's give the stage now to the legendary biking guru, Ben Greenfield. So let's jump into the things that have been working well for me lately. Every Friday night, somebody comes to my house now and does what is called jaw realignment. Anybody in here familiar with your vagus nerve? So your vagus nerve is one of the most important nerves that snakes through your body and it is responsible for, among a variety of activities, including increased hormone production, relaxation, digestive function, etc., activation of your parasympathetic nervous system, and also regulation of your heart's rhythm, your heart's variability via a release of acetylcholine. One of the nerves that is connected to this vagus nerve is called the trigeminal nerve. And what you'll find is that a lot of people, due to tension, due to weightlifting, due to accidents, due to falling down and being clumsy, they basically have jaws that are not aligned properly. How many of you feel your jaw occasionally click? How many of you find yourself clenching your jaw occasionally? I certainly had this problem for a very long time. I'm training for my first cage fight right now in December, so I'm getting hit in the face a lot and my jaw's getting shoved out of alignment all the time. You can actually try this yourself. We can try it right now. Go ahead and using your middle fingers, find that really sensitive spot that's right up towards the upper part of your cheek. So hold some pressure. Now, this is gonna hurt like a mother, but maintaining as much pressure as you can against that sensitive area in the jaw. Slowly open your jaw as wide as you can, and it's gonna hurt. As wide as you can, hold it, hold that pressure and then slowly close. You might get a little bit of a pop. Now jaw realignment, the way that this works is you can work with a chiropractic doc, you can find an active release therapist, you can work with a sports medicine doc. I have a massage therapist who I literally sent a YouTube video on how to do it to, and basically she'll do this for five minutes. She stands above me, finds every single trigger point on the jaw, I open and release. It has changed my sleep quality, the amount of time I spend in my deep sleep cycles. It's affected my parasympathetic nerve function, my relaxation. The next morning when I test my heart rate variability, it's through the roof, but it's just basically jaw realignment. Works really well. It's very similar to craniosacral work on the back of your head. That's also a really good way to target the vagus nerve. That's number one. The next thing would be a brain flush. That's actually me using 810 nanometer light called a Violite inside my nose. It's one of the best ways to target what's called cytochrome P450 in your brain. It's one of the best ways to feed light up into the brain is through the nose. The idea is that I'm very much into shutting down neural inflammation as much as possible. And in addition to doing this now, when I get out of bed, it's a 25 minute cycle that this thing runs for. So I walk around the house in my underwear with the light sticking out of my nose. I've got a few different nutrients that I use specifically to decrease inflammation in the brain and to assist with acetylcholine production. One of those is lion's mane extract. I now use in my coffee every single morning lion's mane extract. It's really good for shutting down neural inflammation. So that's one thing that I now put in my cup of coffee. The next thing that I've been using is bacopa. You don't need very much of it. I'll use like about one eighth of a teaspoonful of bacopa, but it's a really good herb to throw in the coffee in the morning. It mixes really well with lion's mane. This is a blend that's been working extremely well for me. The last one is black ant extract. 
How many of you were at the upgraded dinner last night? We had a whole cup full of black ants that we were actually eating. And these ants actually produce acetylcholine, another really good way to basically activate, enhance neural function in the morning. So I've got a black ant powder, I have bacopa, and then I also have the lion's mane extract, and I mix all of that together. It's in a little black jar in my refrigerator, one of those do not eat type of jars. And I put about a teaspoon of that in my coffee in the morning, along with this light therapy. And that's one of the ways that I've been starting my day now. I swear by that as a morning cocktail. So if you guys want a little morning cocktail to try, I know there's all sorts of blends out there. There's turmeric, there's coconut oil, there's C8, all sorts of things. But this is a really good one I've found to be working quite well for me lately. Not quite as good as, as shooting coffee at my butt, which I talked about at the Finland biohacking event, but it works well. Nobody thinks shooting coffee up your butt is funny. Okay, we'll move on. Hot cold therapy. I now every single morning have been doing a specific protocol after I do that morning cocktail that I just talked about. So has anybody in here ever experimented with high dose niacin? I use like a non-flushing form of niacin that's not metabolized by the liver quite as heavily as regular niacin. It's basically, when you have niacin in your system, it induces your fat cells to release a huge number of A, triglycerides, and B, toxins. If you are actually under an infrared light when you have that niacin in your system. So what I do is after I've done that morning cocktail that I just talked about, I'll take high dose niacin. I use about a thousand milligrams and then I step into an infrared sauna for 30 minutes. Kundalini yoga. I have a custom routine that I'll talk about in just a second. I do 20 to 30 minutes of that in, oddly enough, one of those clear light saunas that's downstairs. I have the great big one that you can do yoga in. And this is how I start my day every single day is with this heat therapy combined with high dose niacin. And then what I do is for five to 10 minutes, I go outside and I do some of this Wim Hof style breathing, which you need to be careful with because you breathe off a lot of carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is your body's trigger to take a breath. So you need to be careful doing underwater swimming after you've breathed off a lot of CO2, but I'll do underwater swimming in this cold pool after I've done the heat therapy. Now you may be thinking, what the hell man, I don't have a, an infrared sauna in my basement or a cold pool out in the forest. You can simulate this just like I did this morning. I do hot, cold in the shower, 20 seconds of cold, 10 seconds of hot, 10 times through for a five minute shower. I do that both morning and evening when I'm traveling. But when I'm at home, I do the infrared sauna. The other thing that I do now for jet lag, a couple of people, they keep asking whether or not I'm jet lag since I got here. I've slept nine to 12 hours a night since I got here. My secret is when I land, I do a Google map search for either Turkish bath Japanese bath or Russian bath. And any of those will have a cold plunge. They also have a steam room and or a sauna. So I have a 60 minute protocol that I use every single time I land in a city because I do not feel like going to the gym. I really don't want to throw down a workout after I hop off the plane. I just feel like shit. I want to go sit in a sauna or sit in a cold pool. So what I do is 15 minutes of sauna to five minutes of cold pool, to 15 minutes of steam room, to five minutes of cold pool, to 15 minutes of hot bath. Most of these have a hot mineral bath, to five minutes of cold pool. And that's my 60 minute routine now that I use. Any time that I travel across multiple time zones, it works like a charm. You can do like the hot cold contrast shower, but for me to pay like 15, 20, 30 bucks to get a day pass to one of these facilities and do something like worth the payoff when it comes to shutting jet lag down. So hot, cold contrast, and specifically some of those forms that I just told you about, they work really well. And then occasionally I'll just put on my underwater MP3 player and literally take like a 15 or 20 minute cold shower and just wait for the, for the hotel to try to knock down my door and tell me to quit wasting water. So I now 365 days a year do intermittent fasting. I do a compressed feeding window of eight to 12 hours. Now, one of the things that I get asked about a lot when it comes to intermittent fasting, so there's a few things that I get asked. First of all, is it different for women versus men? And the answer is actually yes. Women, women have a specific peptide. Men have it, but women have it in greater quantities. It's called kispeptin. And kispeptin responds to feeding signals in the morning and in the evening. 
What it does in response to a properly timed feeding signal is it causes the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. That causes you to churn out luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. When that occurs, it's actually a sign to your body to upregulate metabolism, to stay in a very fertile state, to burn a lot of calories, and to do a lot of the things that you would expect in a body that's staying fertile and healthy, because in many cases, fertility is synonymous with health, especially in women. Now, what intermittent fasting can do is it can actually decrease your sensitivity to that kisspeptin. So that's one of the reasons that you'll find some women don't respond quite as well to like strict intermittent fasting type of protocols. In many cases, you can keep some of these effects at bay by doing something like medium chain triglycerides or brain octane or kind of like the fat in the morning type of coffee approach because you get a lot of calories but at the same time you don't get that big glucose and insulin response that you would if you're eating like eggs and bacon or a fruit smoothie or something like that so for women sometimes doing something like the fatty coffee in the morning but doing an overnight fast works really well for guys i've found that no calories at all in the morning until that 12 to 16 hour fast is over works extremely well for staying lean especially. Now, one of the things that I always do inside that window is a little bit of easy aerobic cardio. For me, now it's that hot, cold contrast that I talked about along with some of this Kundalini style yoga. But basically the idea is that I do this Christmas, Thanksgiving, you name it, 365 days a year, I do an intermittent fast. And it's one of the things that I swear by for staying lean because I have to haul my ass up hills and obstacle races and in triathlons. And so for me, figuring out ways to keep the body fat percentage low is key. And this is one of the things that works extremely well. The other thing that can work well, if you really are trying to get swole, like 70s big, and you want to get some of the benefits of intermittent fasting is essential amino acids. So you can take those in a fasted state. They're not going to bump up insulin or glucose, but they'll keep you anabolic to a certain extent. So you can use like 10 to 20 grams of essential amino acids in a fasted state, even if you're a guy, and that would be a better solution than something like a, like a fatty coffee, which just has a lot of calories in it. All right, let's go on to what I think is number five, this Kundalini Yoga. I wanted to activate certain chakras, like my liver, my brain, my heart, some of the areas that I really wanted to have enhanced for digestion, for cognitive performance, and for cardiovascular performance. And like I mentioned, kundalini yoga, where you're punching the person in front of you in the back and the kidneys, that is a very good way to increase blood flow to the brain. I'm gonna put some links to some really interesting EG research on that specific form of breath work and yoga in the slides that I'm gonna make available to you on my website here. But basically, kundalini yoga, you learn this move, another move is this one, where you're basically slapping different parts of your body as you twist. Another one is you'll reach up and basically push energy behind you and come up and push energy behind you and come up. And after each different form of movement that you do for 60 seconds, two minutes, three minutes, you do that hold where you squeeze everything. You squeeze your crotch, you squeeze your abs, you squeeze your chest, you drop your jaw and relax your head. And then you eventually breathe out and let it out. And I'll do this and get completely covered in sweat, have an amazing workout, move a lot of breath through my body. It works fantastically if you have a little hotel room to work out in if you want to work out in a sauna but the idea is that kundalini yoga is a combination of movement and breath work and again remember what we're talking about are the little biohacks that i've found to work very well recently and this is one of the things that i'm swearing by now now like i said i combine it with that sauna but you can make this part of that morning routine and it counts as the movement that you do when you're in that intermittent fasted state, you can finish this up with something like that hot, cold contrast shower. Amazing way to start your day. Okay, the next one is blood glucose. Small amounts of movement throughout the day are gonna keep your blood glucose normalized. Not snacking a lot, that's also gonna keep your blood glucose normalized. Most of us can know these things. And of course that's important because chronically elevated blood sugar fluctuations in blood sugar cause neural inflammation and vascular inflammation and adherence of glucose to cholesterol particles and atherosclerosis and all sorts of other issues. So we know that we want to control blood glucose and I move all the time. This is just a picture of my office where I've got a treadmill. I also have now a heavy bag next to my desk where after I finish a Skype or a consult or I talk to somebody who's really particularly annoying, I just beat the bag to death for like two or three minutes and then 
get back to work. So I'm, I'm doing these little movements throughout the day to keep blood glucose low, but there are three specific uh, nutrients slash supplements that I use to keep blood glucose normalized and keep myself sensitive to insulin throughout the day. These are just things I do every day. Back in my hotel room right now has a big bottle of apple cider vinegar. I'll buy it when I get into a town. It's cheap, it's easy to find. Keep it at home too. Apple cider vinegar has been shown to lower your postprandial blood glucose when you do the equivalent of about two tablespoons prior to a meal. Okay, so I'll take whichever meal I'm starting off the day with because it's like a good morning tonic and I'll do a couple tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. The next thing that works really well is cinnamon. For cinnamon, you want to use a brand of cinnamon called Ceylon cinnamon, C-E-Y-L-O-N. That's the one that they've actually shown to decrease blood glucose. And the equivalent you need is about two teaspoons. It's a lot of cinnamon. So if I have a cup of coffee, I put a couple of teaspoons of cinnamon in it and you're literally like chewing cinnamon out of the bottom of the coffee. But organic Ceylon cinnamon is best. You can get it off Amazon. You can find it at a lot of health food stores. And again, this is something you would ideally time before you eat a meal that's rich in protein or rich in carbohydrates. Okay, so that's number two. I do apple cider vinegar, the equivalent of about two tablespoons. I do cinnamon, the equivalent of a couple teaspoons. Then the last one is bitter melon extract. And they've actually done some studies comparing bitter melon extract with metformin. And when consumed prior to a meal, bitter melon extract is just as good at lowering your postprandial blood glucose levels. Now, if you wanna test this, there's a really cool monitor called a Dexcom G5. It's a 24 hour continuous blood glucose monitor that you need a physician's prescription for, but it emits very low levels of EMF compared to other 24 hour blood glucose monitors. You can also use just like a basic AccuCheck blood glucose monitor if you wanna test some of this yourself. But those are three things that I use now to control blood glucose or cinnamon, apple cider vinegar, and bitter melon extract. And that's very important to me because I've done genetic testing with 23andMe I know that I have a higher than normal risk for type two diabetes. I compete in endurance sports where my ability to use ketones and be a fat burning machine is really important. So those are some of the things that I use now to control blood glucose. Uh, the next thing is variety. Variety at back in my hotel room again. All of you want to go to my hotel room now because you're learning about all sorts of cool things I have back there. Intranasal light, apple cider vinegar is my ukulele. I travel everywhere with my ukulele now. Not only is music one of those other things that can really help out with vagal nerve tone. It's really interesting. Frequencies, especially music and singing and chanting and gargling and humming. These all help with that vagus nerve that I talked about earlier. But music is one of those things that does a really good job at enhancing neurogenesis and causing release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor and the growth of new neurons. Specifically, learning a musical instrument or learning how to play a new song on a musical instrument that you've already learned. So there's a bag company called Fusion, and they make bags for any type of musical instrument that you could imagine. You could take your jazz flute, you could take your guitar, you could take your ukulele, and these bags fuse to a backpack or any other piece of luggage that you want to fuse them to. So you can take musical instruments anywhere. The cool thing is that airlines seem to really like musicians. When I carried my bike all over the planet doing triathlons, I would get treated like an asshole. When I take my spear fishing gun down to Florida, they don't like that either. But for some reason, I can carry this big ukulele on the plane. Anyways, so variety is key. There's a really good book by Dr. Daniel Amen, who talks about spec scans for the brain and some of the really interesting things that they've found in terms of variety and in terms of different activities targeting different areas of the brain. There's some very interesting things in that book by Dr. Amen, and he talks about how variety is key, how novelty is key, how challenge is key. So you have to have variety, novelty, and challenge. But there, there are some activities in there that I thought were really interesting. For example, what would you guess to be the number one sport on the face of the planet that causes the greatest amount of blood flow to the brain? We're the smartest athletes on the face of the planet. I would have guessed chess. It's actually table tennis, ping pong, really interesting. And I've found that rich people buy ping pong tables and never use them. So they dump them for really good prices on websites like Craigslist and eBay. Get yourself a ping pong table. I actually do this in the morning now. I play ping pong against the wall on the ping pong table because I'm lonely and I don't have any friends to actually play ping pong with it. Now I like all here with my kids sometimes and we have a party at our house. We play ping pong in the basement, but ping pong of all things, table tennis is one of those activities that causes huge amounts of blood flow to the brain. But one of the rules that I live life by is I never go for a month without delving into something that makes my brain uncomfortable. Another example is every Sunday night at our house, the only language you can speak is Spanish. And I suck at Spanish right now, so this is really hard for me. 
but it really gets my brain humming every Sunday night. It's a little bit scary. It's a little bit uncomfortable. But ask yourself as you're going through life, what is it this week that I've really challenged myself with or have I just stayed on cruise control all week? So you have your language games that target your prefrontal cortex, learning new instruments as your temporal lobes, juggling, map reading, parietal lobes, cerebellum, table tennis is another good one. So you can even learn new dance steps. So there you go. Variety. Next up is aromatherapy. Right now, I actually grabbed some downstairs. Right now I have peppermint and sweet orange on my upper lip, okay? So that's one thing that'll use to enhance cognitive performance, and it's been shown to increase production of alpha brain waves. So peppermint is one. A cinnamon is another that acts very similarly in terms of cognitive performance. And then the final one is vanilla, which is actually also an aphrodisiac. So it's got a little bonus. What I do is I actually will take vanilla essential oil. I mix that with sandalwood essential oil. So I'm both smart and completely irresistible to the ladies. And I'll put that like on the back of my neck and my arms. But essential oils for activation of the brain, that's something I've been doing quite a bit of. There's really a total of six that I use quite frequently. The peppermint, the cinnamon, and the vanilla for alertness. And then the rose, the lavender, and the bergamot for relaxation. So if you haven't played around with essential oils at all, they're really cool. There's a bunch of others that I use. I'm doing an experiment right now with blue spruce oil for enhancing testosterone right now. But essential oils are really cool. If you haven't delved into them, ton of fun to play with. Let's talk about some other things about my bedside right there. That's a low intensity pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. They've shown to be very beneficial for everything from enhancing uh, bone healing to enhancing soft tissue healing to giving you like a grounding or an earthing effect. But low intensity, PEMF. It is one of those things that a lot of people who can't handle these more powerful forms of PEMF, like a Beamer or an Earth Pulse or some of these other devices out there, do very well with. And I have clients now who have completely beaten insomnia just by using this single device. A PEMF device that emits a very, very low level signal, about a thousand times less powerful than most of the other devices that are out there. And you place it either over your brachial plexus or over that third eye chakra that we were talking about earlier. And you can actually use a sleep mask, like a wraparound sleep mask to get it over that area of the forehead. Or you can use a double-sided adhesive tape to put it right over the brachial plexus where the stimulation that it creates feeds up to your brain through the nerves that travel between your brain and the brachial plexus, which is kind of like that tender spot right between your collarbone and your shoulder. So I'll put this on and it runs for about 22 minutes and then it turns off. So you put it on right before you fall asleep at night. And then if you wake up during the night, you press the little button on it and it causes you to fall asleep again. And it's very strange. You press the button and it's way down on your shoulder, but you can feel it inside your head. You almost feel these Delta brain waves get created inside your head as you use it. And I'll combine this with things like binaural beats and the lavender, et cetera. And I sleep like a baby. I'll talk in a second about the type of things I'm using for sleep self quantification but I've experimented with all sorts of different PEMF devices, and this one works really well. It's called a Somni Resonance SR1 Delta Sleeper. It's about $500, and in my opinion, I'll pay 10 to 15 bucks, sometimes 20 bucks, for a really, really solid night of sleep. So for me, it's worth the investment, and that's a, a device I'm now swearing by. I also liked it because it's super portable, like the big magnets and stuff that you travel with, TSA does not like those very much, but the little, this little tiny magnet, I've never had a problem with it at all. Next up is self-quantification, the aura ring. I'm using this now for sleep, and it's the only form of self-quantification that I now use because it does not emit a Bluetooth signal. Okay, it has an internal computer on it, so it's just like having your phone in airplane mode. It collects data. When you're ready to sync it up to your device, you can then turn it on, activate the Bluetooth on your device, sync up the data and then turn it back off. So you're not getting exposed to electrical pollution all day long, which, and there are some issues there. There's one study that shows how Bluetooth affects the blood brain barrier in rats. I think it can affect cell membrane function. So I'm not a fan of the Fitbit or the Jawbone or any of these other devices that constantly emit a signal. But basically you can learn all sorts of cool things, heart rate variability and temperature and respiration, heart rate, but I'll play all sorts of little games with this. Like for example, I, brought the temperature of my home from 67 degrees down to 63 degrees. And when I brought the temperature down, my heart rate during the night dropped from 39 down to 36. It occurred two hours earlier than it normally occurs, which is a sign of better recovery when your lowest resting heart rate occurs earlier in the evening. 
and my deep sleep jumped from 11% the night before up to 22% that night. And the only thing that I changed was the temperature of the room. And I've never really been a huge fan of sleep quantification because I've never wanted to have like a device attached to my body while I'm sleeping. I've just always kind of eschewed that idea of the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi and everything else in the bedroom. But this ring is what I use now for self-quantification. I actually found it at the last biohacking conference in Finland. Okay, so a few things. I know I just flew through all that stuff because I wanted to allow some time to just answer your guys' burning questions. When I don't do any of what I just talked about, I can get by just fine. I unplug. Like I camp, I hunt, I'll be up in BC in a couple months in a tent in the cold, absolutely nothing except a boat, right? And I feel okay, but for me to actually live a fully bold, daring, courageous life where I'm traveling around the globe, on and off planes, engaged in modern living, looking at my phone, typing on my computer, bathed in light and having to put up with all the electrical pollution and the brake dust and everything else that I have to deal with when I'm living in a modern society that I cannot escape from, I use this stuff to actually feel much, much better. If I'm out in the middle of the wilderness, I'm just fine. As soon as I'm camping or hunting, I don't use any of this stuff. If I can't, I don't have any electricity. I don't have the ability to use a lot of this. Sometimes I'll use like the essential oils and stuff like that. But ultimately, in the face of modern living, it's a night and day difference in terms of everything from sleep quality to heart rate variability to brain fog in the afternoon to everything else that you can either self-quantify or self-qualify. Do I find that after a week of being in the woods, I want to go back and do like biohacking and stuff like that? No, no, because I'm in the woods, right? Usually when I'm in the woods, what I'm thinking at the end of the day is I just want to go back and see my family and get whatever big animal that I've gotten way the heck out of there so I can go eat it. But ultimately, uh, no, I'm not thinking about biohacking if I'm off hunting just because I don't need to. Because a lot of what we talked about is just mitigating the damage of modern grave. Yes. My three top tips for exercise. Number one is that I rarely do anything that is sympathetic nervous system fight or fight based in the morning. I have found that it is too stressful. I've found that the body really isn't primed in terms of body temperature, post-workout protein synthesis, testosterone, etc. when I'm doing a hard workout early in the morning. So the morning is always like the kundalini yoga, the breath work, the hot cold contrast, stuff like that. Then in the afternoon, I personally usually work out outside rocks, sandbags, logs, ropes. Just basically, I get out in nature. Yesterday, it was out in St. James Park, just running loops around St. James Park and stopping for burpees and little pull-ups on the bars along the park there and mountain climbers. And so that's the style of workout that I do. So that's number one is do your easy stuff in the morning or hard stuff at night. Another one in terms of exercise would be I do a lot of functional exercise. And if I have a resistance to working out, like it's the afternoon and I'm traveling and I'm not quite sure what I wanna do and it's raining outside and I gotta go down in the hotel gym or whatever, I'll typically do a circuit where I choose one strength exercise, one cardio exercise, and one like more relaxing type of core exercise. So I'll do like 60 seconds on the bike, then a set of deadlifts, then a core motion, and then I'll do 60 seconds on the treadmill, then a squat, then a core motion, and then I'll do 60 seconds on a rowing machine, then an overhead press, then a core motion. I'll just do circuits of that for as much time as I have available. Last thing is that constant variety is key. If you're trying to build muscle and just get super duper swole, you have to hit the muscle over and over again from the same angle with the same exercises. So if you wanna be a bodybuilder, you do the same exercises for your chest week after week, month after month, for your quads, for your legs, etc. But if you just want to keep your metabolism elevated and stay functional and healthy, always throw a curveball at your body. The best workout is whichever workout that you're not currently doing. So I'll rarely actually repeat a proper workout, like a kundalini yoga type of session. That's the same, but I don't really consider that a workout as much as a morning movement protocol. But for an actual workout, always change it up. So those are the few little things I do for exercise. Yes. Do I take supplements? I do. I use a creatine for the neurotropic effect just as much as for the muscle and the power sustaining effect. I use fish oil. I use a good multivitamin, and that's usually in the morning. And then in the evening, I use cannabidiol, and I use a small microdose of melatonin combined with something called pH GABA, which is just an inhibitory neurotransmitter that can cross the blood-brain barrier. So those five are typically something that I'll take every day. Fish oil, 
creatine, a mold diet, and in the evening, CBD and a little sleep cocktail. Proper nutrition, if you live on a pristine Himalayan mountaintop and you eat all organic food, chock full of minerals and everything else that you need, and then you also make a decision that you don't want to do what I do, traveling around the globe, competing in some of the most masochistic events on the face of the planet, then you could get away without a multivitamin. But because of the combination of food not really being what it used to be, and also me doing unnatural things with my body, I have to take a multivitamin to get everything that I would actually need without eating copious amounts of food. So thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of that. Thank you, Ben, for that energetic presentation as always on your top 10 daily biohacks. Next, I will give you some of my own things that I do on a daily basis, explaining to you in detail my morning routine. Number one, in the morning when I wake up, I turn on the clear light infrared sauna and a humidifier that's inside it. The humidifier increases respiration, basically making the sauna experience a little bit more effective, and it also helps to moisturize the airways. Next, I do some light movement and stretches to wake up the body. While I wait for the clear light infrared sauna to heat up, I prepare an electrolyte drink with lemon and an electrolyte mix. Sometimes I also use molecular hydrogen. If you want to get some, check out the store at bikercenter.com. Number two, next I prepare my morning coffee. Recently I've been preparing an Americano and mixing it up with grass-fed buffalo or sheep butter, some MCT oil, collagen, reindeer bone broth, some chai spices such as cardamom, cinnamon, vanilla and gloves, functional mushrooms such as chaga, lion's mane and cordyceps, and once in a while I also throw in a blend of 20 different dark pigmented berry powders. That might sound a little bit crazy, but it actually goes very well with this drink, especially if you throw in also a little bit of an extra cacao in the mix. Try it yourself and you might be surprised. Number three, I walk with the coffee in my hand to the clear light infrared sauna, where I turn on the built-in red light device in order to increase some of that mitochondrial function in the morning, reduce inflammation, improve skin health, and generally speaking, it just feels great, especially in winter times. Then I proceed to do a 20-minute breath work and a meditation session. I'm often using different breath work techniques to get my body ready. It helps me to be focused much more easily than if I go straight into a meditation. In the end of that, I drink half of the coffee while I journal my daily priorities. Number four, at 45 minute mark, I come out of the sauna and proceed in performing a short morning workout. I use kettlebells, the X3 bar, which is basically based on resistance bands, and some exercises I've been doing recently to improve my hip movement and posture. I discovered that when you do a workout right after an infrared sauna session, you get much better results as the infrared sauna boosts nitric oxide and acts as a light pre-workout. Number five, after all this is done, I take a shower under the filtered shower head. I proceed with the rest of the coffee in my hand in front of the standing desk, and that's when I start my work day. And by the way, this is when I finally take my mobile phone out of the airplane mode. I recommend you to try that, because if you start your day with the mobile phone in your hand, it increases probably stress, brings up all kinds of other priorities that are not part of your morning routine. So there you go. That's my morning routine in detail that I've been practicing recently. I would love to hear about your morning routine, so feel free to tag me on Instagram and share your practice. My account is at Teemu Arina, and you can also use at Biohacker Summit. Thank you very much for listening. To learn more about biohacking and some of the products I mentioned, check out bikercenter.com, where you can find best content, supplements, technologies, courses, retreats and events such as the Biker Summit so that you can take your health and habits to the next level. That's all folks. Stay updated with your daily routines and see you next time.